Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Policy Punchline. Um, we have with us today Dr. Ahmet Kuru. Thank you so much for being with us today for this episode. Um, I'm Bailey Ransom, a junior at Princeton in SPIA, and I have my co-host Sam Lee with me. And hi, I'm Sam Lee. I'm a junior in Princeton University's Economics Department. Uh, Professor Kuru, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. So the first thing that we wanted to ask you today to just give readers a little overview is, could you tell us a little bit about your early life and professional career and what led you to where you are today? So I was born in Turkey and uh, Turkey is the country that followed the legacy of the Ottoman Empire. Therefore, in many people's mind, there is this question, what happened? How come after so many centuries of supremacy and importance, we end up with not that much important country? Uh, what went wrong? That's the question, at least in my family, since my father was a politician and an intellectual, the question was always there. And as I explained in the preface of my new book, Islam, Authoritarianism and Underdevelopment, a global and historical comparison, which was published last year by Cambridge University Press. The, the question grappled me for a very long time. Then I came to the United States 20 years ago, first to Utah for masters, then University of Washington, Seattle for PhD, and wrote my first book on secularism and state policies. And in fact, it was published with this title, Secularism and State Policies Towards Religion, the United States, France, and Turkey. And it was a comparison of Turkish secularism, very much similar to French laicite, and different from American understanding, what I call passive secularism. And that book was about constitutional principles, but I decided to write a book 10 years later with a much deeper analysis of historical roots of the problems of authoritarianism and underdevelopment. And there were, of course, many factors motivated me, especially the main big question, as I explained, grapple with me since my childhood. But at the same time, the breakdown of democracy in Turkey, the failure of Arab uprisings except Tunisia really led me to analyze the deeper historical roots of the problems in 49 Muslim majority countries. So that's the short answer to your question about my background and the motivations about the background of this new book. Right, and, and you mentioned your new book, uh, Islam Authoritarianism and Underdevelopment. Could you give us you know, a little background of, of what the book is about, what question you seek to answer, and uh, what methodology you use to go about looking for that answer? So I'm a political scientist, therefore it was uh, very challenging for me to write a book with that much historical analysis. Of course, social scientists in general, political scientists in particular, uh, use comparative historical methods but I need to, to go beyond the classical notion of comparing cases. For this book, for example, uh, I, I read very intensively some major Islamic thinkers of 10, 11, 13, and 14 centuries, especially Ghazali, who has been a very influential Islamic figure, according to some scholars, Ghazali is the second most important figure in Islam after Prophet Muhammad. Another scholar I had to read intensively was Ibn Haddun and his famous book Muqaddima and Ibn Rushd. So therefore, it is not a typical political science book. The first part is designed as such, where I analyze three problems, violence, authoritarianism, and socioeconomic underdevelopment. It's a typical political science book, but the past section, the, the, the cold past about history, 
and there, there are very much engagement with ideas of early Islamic thinkers, then early modern, uh, then modern reformists. That was a major challenge for me to do this interdisciplinary study for publishing this book. One thing when reading your book I came across is your um, analysis of how most scholars are stuck within the camps of the essentialist approach or the post-colonial or anti-colonial approach. Um, so what would you tell our listeners about these two approaches and how have you differentiated yourself from them? In general, the social scientific theories are not directly related to the person on the street, but in this case they are. Because if you ask the question of authoritarianism and underdevelopment, the person on the street in the Middle East, even in the United States, you may have easily, you may easily hear about these two arguments that some people blame Islam, whereas others blame Western imperialism. And last month, a Norwegian diplomat reviewed my book in a socialist Norwegian newspaper. It's a well written long review. Then it was picked by a right wing, almost Islamophobic newspaper. They republished it. It created a debate. An anthropologist criticized the reviewer, saying that how come you use the term Muslim word? There is no such thing exist. That each country is different. You can't put all 49 of them in the same basket. So you see in Norway, Turkey, US, right wing scholars, politicians, newspapers, they are tended to blame Islam. And it's easy because if you look at 49 Muslim countries, you see many problems and the correlation is clear. But what is the causation? What is the mechanism? This is the problem. This is challenging. And I think they failed to explain us the mechanism itself. On the other side, the left wing, maybe as a reaction, maybe as a sympathy to the underprivileged Muslims, maybe as a result of a conscience, the conscience that they are Western people who regret the Western colonial legacy. They blame imperialism as the mother of all evils. And that's why my book really receive criticism from both sides. Some people criticize my book. I think very much an unfair critic that it's a book promoting Islamophobia, which is not the case. It's very unfair. Then others says that I undermine too much of post-colonial theory. And I think it's now time to really go beyond this Orientalist or Islamophobic or essential cliches about Islam and how it is linked to authoritarianism. But it is also time to really go beyond the postmodern, postcolonial rhetorics and keep referring to Edward Said's book Orientalism. Labeling every critical mind as Orientalist is not taking to anywhere. It's really a waste of time. So that's the uh, goal of the book, challenging these two alternative theories, explanations. I take them seriously in the book. Right now in the conversation, maybe I undermine them too much, but in the book, I take them very seriously and try to show their weaknesses. A similar follow-up question I had to that was, you mentioned that you've been criticized by different journalists and groups. Um, how have other scholars and academics responded to your book? So in, for some of them, the best critical response is to, is to ignore. For example, the, some important scholarly, how should I put it, blogs, they invite me to organize a book forum. I brought together six different scholars with various backgrounds in order to have a discussion about my book. So then they totally reject the plan. 
And then a friend of mine said that you shouldn't have applied the first place. I asked why, because they are postmodernists. They, they would never publish even a critique of your book. So this is really unfortunate to hear that if you receive a negligence, a total indifference or apathy, that that's worse than being criticized. And scholarly realm academia should not be that much really divided on perspectives. We should be open in order to have really a fruitful and creative dialogue. No, you, you talked a little bit about how you, you know, reject both the colonialist approach and the, the essentialist approach. What exactly were your findings in the book and what's the argument that you hope to advance? The argument is about class relations. So from the 8th to 12th centuries, especially from 9th to 11th centuries, Muslims had a so-called golden age of philosophy and economy. They, were, they achieved scientific developments. Kharazmi was an important mathematician. Him and others, he and others learned Arabic numerals and other mathematical formulas from India and then taught it to Western Europe. Today, what we call algorithms, algebra, are coming from Kharazmi and his books. Then al Haysan was an important scholar who produced the prototype of camera, camera obscura. Then Razi was a major medical scientist, differentiates chicken pox and smallpox. So there is a long list and I try to summarize them in the chapter four because most books and articles analyzing current problems of Muslim majority countries ignore their early achievements. But Muslims had a golden age of science and philosophy. And in chapter four of my book, when I analyze, I again engage with two polar opposite arguments. One argument is that this golden age had nothing to do with Islam. It's all Greek philosophy. It's all about some agnostics, some critical minds, not so Muslim scholars. That, that, that's how Muslim achievements occur in a very secularist manner. So I criticize the argument. And then even today in social media, some people, uh, responded me saying that it's all about Western philosophy, nothing to do with Islam. I asked them, what do you mean by Western philosophy? Because Germany, historically, had nothing to do with Greek philosophy, zero whatsoever. Britain had zero connection because Greek philosophy was very Eastern because the birthplace uh, of the Greek philosophy was today's Greece, today's Turkey, today's Egypt, even Italy, in the Roman Empire period, there were some Greco-Roman scholars there, but the main area, Turkey, Greece, and Egypt. So therefore, the concept we use about uh, Western philosophy is really ma not, not making sense about history. So that's one aspect. The other counter-argument is that the Golden Age is all about piety. Today's Islamists, they say, oh, we were good Muslims, that's why we produce cutting edge scholars between eight to 12 centuries. Then we stop being pious Muslims. That's the result. This is also very misleading, Islamist cliche. It's not true because Muslim civilization at that time includes agnostics, some Christians, Jews, Zoroastrians. It was an eclectic civilization and it was, that was its achievement to bring together people with various backgrounds to produce science and economic uh, production. It's like Hellenism or today's United States bringing people with sharply different backgrounds and in order to provide them an opportunity to produce. So this golden age was very crucial. And my argument about that was the two classes, the economic entrepreneurs, you can call them merchants or even bourgeoisie, and the other intellectuals. Intellectuals can be philosophers, polymaths, as I just briefly mentioned, or Islamic scholars, alim, singular, ulema, plural, 
who were independent of the state during this golden age, mostly. 90% of them were funded by commerce and other private sector rather than being state servant at that time. So then you had this economic entrepreneurs and intellectuals creating a competitive environment in which Muslims made important contributions to philosophy and economy. And between the 9th and 11th centuries, they were much superior to Western Europeans on these issues. And paper, for example, was, was something important for Muslim civilization. They learned how to make paper from China in the 8th century, then produced enormous libraries with hundreds of thousands of books. And then it took five centuries for Western Europe to catch up with, to start producing paper. So then my argument is that in this early Islamic history of golden age, Muslims had two dynamic classes, bourgeois and intellectuals. But in the mid 11th century, things change because of many economic, political and military reasons there emerge a new alliance between the ulama, Islamic scholars, you can call them as type of clergy, and the state, mostly military authorities. And this alliance marginalizes intellectuals and merchants. This alliance control economy, private lands, private entrepreneurship. This alliance established series of network of madrasas turning the ulama into state servants. And this model of ulama state alliance emerged in Central Asia, Iran, Iraq in the mid 11th century, transformed and imported by Syria and Egypt in mid 12th century. When it came to 13th and 14th century, it became dominant throughout the Muslim world. And the result is economic and intellectual stagnation. And this argument, has major implications for today. Today in the Muslim world, we see a trend of Islamization in politics, emphasis on ulama state and the alliance between ulama and state. And I think this is a major problem. Muslims should stop following these alliances even today. With, but this is very strong because it has long dure historical roots. Thank you for that insight into your argument, Professor Kuhura. And it's a perfect transition into a question specifically about the Uma that we had wanted to ask you. So you argue that the Uma state alliance um, between the government and the religious elite, as you said, sought to undermine the influence of the independent intellectual and bourgeoisie class, um, which contributed to the economic, cultural, and intellectual stagnation of Muslim countries in some ways. So why is this class so important to social and economic development? Initially, this class was one of the alternatives. There were scholars, so the, these four classes had some level of autonomy and interdependence, and people had options. And even the ulema was a very weak class from 8th to mid 11th century. Islamic scholars were at the same time having professions like being a merchant, like being a barber, being a carrier porter, etc. But the more the state provides them funding and opening madrasas, schools to train them as a class, the more they start to turn into a clergy in the sense of the Catholic Church. And the Sunni Islam normally reject the notion of clergy, but practically this class emerged by the mid 11th century and it came all the way today. Today in Turkey, Egypt, Pakistan, everywhere, these ulama have their own specific dress codes like the clergy in the Orthodox Church or the Catholic Church. They have their own institutions and they claim to have a monopoly. And people who are not belong to this class 
have no rights or legitimacy to talk about Islam. So then it is really becoming like a Catholic church. If you compare Protestants and Catholics, you know the funny description that in Catholicism, the priest fire you, but in Protestantism, you fire the priest because the Catholic church can excommunicate you. But in a general Protestant church notion, if you don't like the priest, you change him, her with a new one. So the Muslim world transform from more Protestant type, bottom up, flexible, vague notion of Islam to a, a particular one in both Sunni and Shia world with a well-defined clergy claiming an authority, rejecting other people's interpretations of Islam. And even today, this class of ulama have enormous level of political power, social legitimacy and religious monopoly. That's why Islamic thought has been very much frozen. So you may have here that Islam has some political projects, political demands. What are they? The basic issue is caliphate and Sharia based state. So I look at all books written about this issue and whomever look, find out that throughout Islamic history, there are only two and a half books written on caliphate and Sharia state. One book, Mawardi, 11th century, the half book or even a, a quarter of a book by Ghazali in his al iktisad fil And the third book is Ibn Taymiyyah's book in 13th century. And then you would be surprised. I think there are two explanations. One explanation, this enormous monopoly of this class, ulama, that didn't allow other people to write about the topic. The second, there is very little in the Quran and Hadith. That's what you cannot write. That's, that, that's what you ha only have two and a half books. So this is the importance of ulama class. And I think the power of the class in the Sunni world is that they are smart enough to keep them discreet behind the scene. The Catholic church is too much visible. Therefore, people can easily criticize. The Shia clergy in Iran made a major mistake in 1979 by capturing power, imposing a supreme leader. Now they are too visible and tangible, and soon they will be destroyed by the, by the resistance, critical young people, because everyone in Iran who is not happy with the regime blamed the clergy. Sunni ulama for centuries deny their existence as a clergy. They say there is no ruhban. Ruhban basically means uh, clergy. In Sunni Islam, we are all the same. But in reality, they have the institutions, monopoly, power, even the type of dress codes. But this denial of existence was their main power. Let me give one example. The printing press, the Ottoman ulama was primarily responsible for the fact that for three centuries, the printing press was not adopted by Ottoman Muslims. And if you ask today Turkey, most people say, no, ulema had nothing to do with that. Well, who? And then there is no physical leader like Pope. There was Sheikh Islam, a leader, but no one knows the name of Sheikh Islam at that time. Therefore, this invisibility, this strategic ambiguity helped the ulama so far. And I think my book may serve to really pinpoint and make this intangible thing very tangible. Right, and, and you mentioned Iran, which is a really interesting example of you know, where this ulama state alliance really comes to the forefront of the public eye and we can see it in action. What does that alliance look like in countries where it isn't so obvious, like, like Turkey or Egypt, for example? So, in Turkey and Egypt, it was very discreet, but now that's why many people was criticizing the state 
and especially in Turkey, secular state for all the problems. But now the Diyanet in Turkey has become very visible. Today, there is a government agency called Directorate of Religious Affairs and in Turkish acronym Diyanet. It controls over 100,000 mosques or about and about 100,000 imams and pay their salaries. And every Friday, the sermon, the text is written centrally in Ankara or whatever the Diyanet headquarters is and then sent to mosques so that you have the standard hutbah friday sermon in 100 different thousand different places so it's a government agency very much centralized very visible and in egypt there is the mufti there is the al-hasar many ulama institutions they are now becoming more and more visible because the whole notion of islamization bring Islamic law in forefront and even Islamists like Ihwan Muslim brothers in Egypt put in the constitution of Egypt they drafted that the ulama of LSR the LSR University in Cairo decide what Sharia is they decide what Islamic law is so therefore it's like a trap that you enter as a normal Muslim. So are you Muslim? Yes. Do you accept Islamic law? Yes, of course. And who has the authority to decide Islamic law? Ulema. Then you accept the authority of ulema. Yes, that's it. In very few basic steps, Muslims put themselves in a position of being loyal to a group of scholars who have, who have no way of check and balance, control, and reward and punish. So this is a major problem for any notion of democracy, any notion of transparency. And I, I, sorry, you, ahead, sorry about that. I'd like to you know, follow up on what you were saying about, I think Turkey is a really fascinating example because we saw in the 20th century with, uh, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, Kemal Ataturk uh, really rose to the forefront of this you know, secularization movement in Turkey. He really sought to modernize and westernize the country. What happened? What, I guess what, what I want to know, was Ataturk unsuccessful in um, disenfranchising or disempowering the ulema? Yes and no. Uh, let's start with the negative one. No, he is not totally unsuccessful because there is today maybe 25% of the population define themselves Kemalist or follower of Atatürk's principles. So there is a segment. It's not majority. It never was a majority in Turkish society, but 25% or so is a large amount of people. And in terms of defending the idea of modernization, so things, of course, modern institutions was built in uh, the modern Turkey, uh, both state and private sector. So this is one thing. The other thing I would say, yes, he is unsuccessful because now Tayyip Erdogan is ruling power in Turkey and symbolically and in terms of public discourse, it's no longer a secular country, no longer a secular state. The laws are still secular, the constitution laws on code book, but the public discourse is no longer secular. Uh, recently, for example, the headquarter of Turkish intelligence agency, like the equivalent of American CIA, was opened with the prayers of the chief imam of Diyanet. It shows this, the ceremony, I watched the video, is a perfect example of the combination of religion and state, the leader, the leading imam of Diyanet was having a long prayer for the success of the chief spy of country. So that was really an eye opener about how the secular state under erosion and more Islamist discourse dominate Turkish public life today. 
Professor Guru, I also had sort of jumping back to a more generalist perspective on the Ulama State Alliance. Mm -hmm. um, so you, in your book, you describe it as a partnership rather than a one-way relationship. So can you elaborate on this for me? What does the state gain out of the relationship? And are there some countries in the modern um, Muslim world where the balance is tipped more towards the Ulama or the state government or, yeah, either way? We have very good questions. You are, you are asking both of you very good questions. And this particular one is important because whenever I present the book, there are those who says it's all about state. Ulema is undermined by the state. State contour religion, not vice versa. And there are also those who say, no, it's all about ulema. They shape religion so much that the state is secondary. And I, my answer to both group of uh, critiques is that no, it is an alliance. And as you rightly like say, it's a partnership. Look, in Iran, there is the supreme leader position and the mullahs have a semi-theocratic regime. You may assume that it's all about ulama, but it is not because Khomeini, despite his theory of velayat faqih which means the tutelage of the jurists, when it came to real politics during the Iran-Iraq war, he declared that the state interests come first. If the state interest requires, the Islamic state can cancel even religious worshiping like five times a day, prayer, fasting, etc. So the supreme leader who was supposed to put religion first said that raison d'etat, the logic of state, state interest is paramount and Islamic state is more important than worshiping. So then here you see again, religion, politics, amalgamation, overlapping. Even in Saudi Arabia, you see the king appears to be supreme, but without the Wahhabi ul ulama, clergy, the king's legitimacy would be questioned. Even in the Ottoman Empire, some people may assume that it is the Sultan controlling everything, including ulama, but many Sultans were replaced by a fatwa of ulama. So it's two side relations. Even the seculars couldn't solve this problem because in Turkey, Egypt, for various reasons, secularists always try to put religion within the state. Atatürk established the Dianet as government agency, never thinking to separate it in a private, more religious, autonomous realm. And let me finish by referring to a previous question about the success and failure of Kemalism, the ideology of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. I think while trying to put aside ulama, Atatürk and many other Muslim reformists overemphasized the bureaucracy. So the main mistake of this secularist reformers was that they were too much authoritarian, too much top down, following authoritarian European models rather than more liberal American models. And in using again my book's terminology, this secularist reformers was very anti-intellectual and anti-bourgeois. Therefore, they didn't see the real problem in the Muslim world. Simply attacking ulama is not the solution. You have to promote the intellectuals and the bourgeois. It's really interesting to hear sort of a, a different perspective on how it's a, a mutually beneficial relationship or how in many states the heads of state would lack legitimacy without the um, sort of various positions of their national ulama behind them. So what led you to examine this sort of unique perspective as an alliance of a cause of intellectual and socioeconomic stagnation? So for social scientists, a major question to ask the relationship between ideas and material conditions. And whenever you try to fix problems in the Muslim world, including women's rights, minority rights, participatory politics, you 
look both sides, both the material structure and ideas. So the material structure, so there may be poverty, illiteracy, political chaos, prevent reforms. But there are ideas. If we take example, the three issues I mentioned, women's rights, patriarchy is not simply something persist as a result of mode of production and relations of production. There are, of course, ideal, ideological sources of patriarchy everywhere, even in the United States. So if, let's say in a particular Muslim country, in mosques on Friday, the imams preach that men is superior to women. And I myself attend such sermons in 2000, 10 in Damascus, in a mosque, the Imam on Friday, saying that uh, there is this idea of equality is a stupid idea. So if many Imams in many mosques, in many Islamic circles promote these ideas, or when it comes to minority rights, if Islamists, Sufi Sheikhs, Ulema promote the idea that non-Muslims are secondary citizens, so whatever you put in as a material explanation will remain weak and incomplete. So this is a very thin, very fragile, sensitive balance. I don't say that it's all about Islamist ideas. Of course, there are material factors. That's why in my book, I analyze oil revenue, how oil hinders democracy. I analyze the historical ICTA and TAMAR system of land revenue distribution, which is comparable with feudalism in Western Europe and how this destroy monetary economy and marginalize merchants and make ulama state servants. But while doing so, I also take ideas of Ghazali, Mawardi very seriously. So some readers dismiss too quickly saying that, oh, no one takes this idea seriously. I am shocked to hear that. How do you say that no one takes them seriously? In the Muslim world, according to public surveys, in Southeast Asia, according to Pew survey, overwhelming majority of people says the apostate should be killed. In Middle East, 50% says apostate should be killed. In some African part and some, yeah, I, I said Southeast Asia. Okay, in South Asia, overwhelming majority. Middle East, 50. Southeast and some Africa, 25%. So overall, if say 50% says apostates should be killed, how can you as a social scientist dismiss this and say that, oh, no one take them? No, people take these ideas seriously. And we know in the United States, for example, many racist people, when you are asked in a survey, etc., do not really reflect their racist ideas because they're ashamed. So in the Muslim world, there are patriarchal ideas, ideas against Christian and Jews, ideas about apostasy. Even if you don't hear every day, you don't need to hear every day. In Pakistan, if there are a hundred lynchings of people for blasphemy apostasy, that's enough number to scare the entire society. You don't need to lynch a million people. So therefore, we, it is time for social scientists to take these ideas seriously without being an Islamophobe, without putting all Muslims in the same basket, but we have to look at the text read in madrasas. We have to look at the source of ideas and I think th this is very important. Therefore, let me conclude by saying that uh, the material structure and ideas are interrelated. And, and, and analysis in order to be complete should look at both sides. And what would need to change in order for you know, us to start seeing some sort of improvement? Mm -hmm. Is it, do we need, do people in these countries need to go after that Ulema State Alliance or or is there something else that, that needs to happen in order to spur socioeconomic development? A complete imitation of the West is not the solution. 
that's a mistake Atatürk and made the reforms try and failed. If you say that uh, democracy is good, competition, diversity is good because it is Western, many people in the Middle East and Western world reject the idea. But I think this is not necessary. It is wrong, but also historically not necessary because Muslims had their own early history of inspiration. They can have a renaissance by looking the origin where there is more egalitarianism, more progress, more diversity, competition. If Muslims in 8, 9, 10, 11th century were open-minded enough to learn Greek philosophy, to have exchange with non-Muslims, establish intercontinental trade, then allow Christian and Jewish philosophers flourish under Muslim rule. Why not to be less open-minded today? And to see the declining toleration is key to understand intolerance today. Let me give you an example. In Baghdad, in ninth century, Muslims established the biggest hospital of the time. And then the chief medical doctor of the hospital was a Christian. And many Christian and Jews were professing and functioning as medical doctors in the hospital. Four centuries later, in Egypt, Cairo, Muslims established a major hospital, the Al Mansur Hospital. But this time, the written documents of the hospital require that non Muslims can be neither a doctor nor a patient. And three medical doctors of the Sultan were the top of their profession and the Sultan asked them to convert to Islam in order to be the doctors in this major hospital. So this show the declining toleration, declining openness. So you can explain. So when I look at the difference, 9th century Baghdad, 13th century Cairo in my book, I said the background of crusaders because the Egyptians at the time, the Mamluks, were very much reactionary to crusader attack, which make them anti-Christian. But these things persist. You provide a reaction to a particular thing, but then it stays with you until you deconstruct, analyze it, and prove that it's wrong. Then it is not supposed to be reproduce itself. So that's what I'm trying to do, saying that, look, certain notions exist in the Muslim world today, like, for example, in Turkey, Dinu Devlet, Din, religion and state. These are two holy twins appreciated, almost worshipped by many people. But when you show that this is not an Islamic idea, this is a very much Sasani idea, so I don't simply say Sasanis are bad, but they are not holy Quranic things. It is a pre-Islamic Iranian thought. And I, in each chapter, I discuss a particular hadith that religion and state are Tibian brothers. It is a fabricated hadith. It, is not, it has nothing to do with Prophet Muhammad. But in order to justify this alliance, major Islamic scholar fabricated this as a hadith, as a prophet saying, and then keep teaching that religion and state are twins. They are brothers. They are both holy, which is wrong because early Islamic scholars put a distance between themselves and state. Early Islamic scholars regard state as corrupt. That's why they were dynamic, creative. That's why today, we don't have a creative ulema. Ulema are just conservative, stagnant. They follow whatever written centuries ago. Great. And um, just, just to kind of follow up on, on something that you said a little bit earlier, um, you know, in so many of the, these Muslim countries, which a lot of them are concentrated in the Middle East, or there's the concept of the rentier state in which the state uses, in many cases, oil rents as a way to, uh, no, I don't want to say bribe, but you know, they offer these rents to their citizens in exchange for their political rights. 
how does this concept, I guess, play into the ulema state alliance that, that exists in so many of these states? So neither ulama nor the state is a productive class, therefore they always need an external funding. It was historically the agricultural revenues they share by ikta tamar system for state officials and the wakuf endowment for madrasas and ulama. Today they must use oil revenues. 60% of oil reserves of the world are in Muslim majority lands and many Muslim countries are oil dependent. If they are not, they receive money from oil rich countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia. And that's how Iran and Saudi Arabia and other oil rich countries perpetuate their own ulema state alliance and also import their notion of Islamism to neighboring Muslim countries who needs money and who needs this oil foreign aids. So what do you think, do you think without those oil rents, the Ulema State Alliance wouldn't be able to persist for so long? It will lose a major pillar of its existence. So, you know, a political power, a political hegemony is based on three things, coercion, patronage, legitimacy. So patronage is most about oil. Legitimacy is about using religion. And if you take these two, they will stay with coercion. And coercion itself is not enough to keep a hegemony. Right, and, and how can, you know, one of the, you know, the things that we see in terms of US foreign policy is, um, you know, a support of the Saudi state. Is there anything that the US can do uh, to kind of, I don't know, further the, the socioeconomic development, further the uh, opening of these countries to alternative perspectives? Because uh, I think a lot of people would criticize the United States for you know, creating a relationship in which there's a lot of antagonism between the peoples of these countries, which you know, would maybe strengthen the notion that, that there shouldn't be an exchange of ideas. So... I tried to write two pages about U.S. foreign policy toward the Middle East in my book. I was only able to write, I think, one page because it's so inconsistent and shallow. And every president almost has the back and forth. Bush, H.W. Bush, then followed by Obama. Sometimes they have the euphoria of spreading democracy in the region, then they faced the reality, become disappointed, and went back to the original idea of U.S. Pr priorities in the Middle East, such as the uh, protection of the state of Israel, maintenance of oil supply, avoidance of Islamist regimes, and fighting against terrorism. So democratization is not in this list, as you see. It's temporarily, in 2004 and 5, President Bush, 2009 Obama, they had an emphasis on democracy, then they stopped having such emphasis. It's very inconsistent what the United States is trying to do. Even geopolitically, it's not consistent. For example, in the last 10 years, whatever United States has done, such as invasion of Iraq, empower Iran. But if you ask American policymakers, they portray Iran as not a friendly regime and it's very much hard to explain how come United States is empowering an unfriendly regime. So therefore, it is ambiguous. And let me conclude by saying that in one of my presentations, uh, a professor criticized me saying that you try to impose American agenda in the Middle East. Uh, and it was in Japan, a Japanese scholar in Tokyo. I asked, what do you mean? He said that you said um, Muslims should be democratic, this American propaganda, etc. And then I taught him that I wish there was such an American project of democratizing the Middle East. But it, it, there is no such thing. Professor Kuru, on the topic of democracy, I wanted to ask sort of more of a, a current event related question. So back in April, you wrote an article that we reviewed um, from the International Policy Digest about political impl implications of coronavirus. 
And so you said that while it has sort of worsened Erdogan's financial crisis and diminished the reputation of the Emet, Erdogan is using it as an opportunity to unify people through his sort of um, charisma. So now in September, having um, more, more months of experience with the pandemic, how would you assess the effects of COVID on Erdogan? Yeah, thank you. So that article was originally published in the conversation Then many venues, as you mentioned, uh, republish because of the relevancy to this pandemic. And there has been a debate whether the pandemic will empower or weaken authoritarian leaders such as Putin. And we still don't know. They say it is still too early to talk about the results of the French Revolution today, right? It's, I think it's a joke, but it's true about COVID that it's too early. Possibilities are, on the one hand, with economic crisis, people be more critical and authoritarian leaders face deeper reaction and resistance. But this may be a long-term result. A short-term result is unification around the leaders. Under crisis, a foreign attack or a pandemic, many people may want to support the leader in order to save the boat that every one of us in it. Even Trump in the US tried to image himself as the leader to lead us to safer costs under this crisis. And we'll see whether Erdogan will end up with a stronger or weaker popular support after this pandemic. And what about the Ulema State Alliance in Turkey? Are there any implications of this crisis on that alliance? Do you think it will strengthen it and strengthen its legitimacy in the eyes of the people? Similarly, it may be either way. Look at the major external crisis Muslim had during the Crusader and Mongol invasions. On the one hand, as I explained in chapter five of my book, the Mongol destruction of cities, massacre of millions, and crusaders attack weaken Ulema state because the state itself was collapsing with this attack. But on the other hand, it empowers the Ulema state alliance because when you see massacring of millions, you need a military hero to protect yourself, your family, and your survival you are not looking for good art and music and philosophy and science. That's how Saladin emerged as a hero against the Crusaders. The Mamluks in Egypt emerged as a hero against both the Crusaders and the Mongol incursion. And similarly, today we may see the both ways, as I said, in the short run, many people may be more obedient to the regime, even if it's authoritarian. But in the long run, there may be crises. In Europe, for example, uh, there were both agency-based changes and structural changes. So structural changes that really makes the European er arise possible include the Black Death after the plague, 25% or 30% of our Europeans die. And rather than destroying urban life, it's as an unintended consequence, revive urban life in the 14th, 15th century Europe. But at the same time, these structural changes are not enough. Agencies should do things within the limits. Europeans, for example, black that plaque came both Middle East and Europe. It had better results in Europe but not so much in Egypt and not elsewhere. Because in Europe, there was a rising intellectual class and especially bourgeois class in town and cities, the bourgeois revived economy right after the plague. Whereas in Egypt, Memnuks already destroyed the merchant class, increased the level of state control. With the plague, economy became even more destroyed. So therefore, we always look at the relationship between agency and structure. If agency is human beings are doing what they can do best, even in a challenging conditions, they may lead to better results. But the agency, if they don't do what they are supposed to do, 
if there is no creativity, dynamism, a structural challenge like a plague, like a pandemic, like a war may lead to further decline. And we wanted to ask as well, are you personally optimistic about the future? Do you foresee a change in this Luma state relationship? I am optimistic. That's what I write this book. And I think ideational works can make a contribution and may help at least some readers to have a new perspective. And the reception of the book has made me even more optimistic because now there is an Indonesian translation and Indonesian media and both some secular party members and some members of Nahdatul Ulama and Muhammadiyah read the book, emailed me, shared message with Twitter. In Malaysia too, there is now a group of readers of my Islam book. In Pakistan, almost weekly now I have, I'm giving interviews to podcasts and videos and written interviews. There's a big interest given that they use also English as a medium of communication in Pakistan. And now the book is being translated to Persian and I gave a major interview to a leading economic magazine in Iran and they publish in Farsi in the title saying ulama state source of authoritarianism and underdevelopment. So I'm very happy to see that they passed the censorship and was a, they were able to publish it in Persian in Iran. And I gave an interview to Al Ahram in Egypt's leading newspaper. It was critical of the military regime. It was also somehow passed the censorship, maybe because it was English rather than Arabic. So in Euronews Turkish, uh, publish a, a major interview about the book in Turkish, which were received. And of course, in the United States, there are interactions among Muslims, non-Muslim scholars and non-academic people, which made me more hopeful that even for such an academic book, an ordinary people, I mean, non-political scientists, non-academic uh, people, uh, they engage, they want to be part of the discussion. It shows that there's a demand and there should be more supply, more books, teamworks, workshops, discussing the ulama state, discussing the possibility of a rising intellectual and bourgeois class. So in 1970s, 80s, 90s, it was uh, these three decades uh, were time of criticizing seculars. Now it's time to criticize Islamists. Islamists for long blame secularists for the bad things happening in the Middle East and they came to power in various ways. In Iran, they came to power as a revolution. In the Gulf, they have always been power as a traditional class. In Turkey, they came to power with a popular regime and wherever they came to power, they did not fulfill any of the promises because they have a simplistic knock slogan that Islam is the solution. But how would you solve economic problems? How would you solve problems about poverty? There is no answer. It's just a slogan. And with more critics of Islamist trend now, uh, the book is receiving more attention. It's really interesting to hear about all the different countries in which your book has been published, especially the censorship laws. And we're really glad to be part of that conversation as well. Um, so thank you again for being here. Thank and you. unfortunately, as we sort of near the end of our time together, um, given that the name of our show is Policy Punchline, we always like to ask our guests at the end of the interview, what's your punchline here? So the punchline is that this is an academic book, but I can end with more policy recommendation for Muslim majority societies. And if I was a politician, I would say that stop following blindly ulama and the state, give a chance to intellectuals and bourgeoisie. This is my punchline. Great. And 
Pro Professor Kuru, is there anywhere else uh, that our, our listeners can learn more about your ideas, of your website, Twitter? Yeah, both. I have a website in my San Diego State University webpage, and I have a, an English and Turkish Twitter accounts. Uh, they can easily find if they Google my name, and I put all the interviews and reviews and my op-eds to my website and publish them in my Twitter account as well. And we'll be sure to uh, include your Twitter account and your website on, on our website. That will be great. Thank you. There'll be lots of access there. Thank you again, Professor Kuru. This is Thank you. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Thanks for your excellent yeah. questions. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.